Now, case number seven is kind of a tricky one. Where is it? Case seven. A 49-year-old man with a lower leg lesion. We didn't tell you about how big it is, but it looks pretty big. Look yeah. at this thing. It's like a mile wide. It's like a it's like a someone cut a huge brick out of it, and it's still nowhere near the periphery of the lesion. Okay. You know, one thing that stands out to me here is this. These kind of cells are kind of plump, look like fibroblasts or histiocytes or something, and there's some foamy cells here. See, that sometimes when we flip the condenser, it'll help us. Well, not quite today. But it can sometimes help you see the foamy bubbliness, particularly under the microscope. But there's actually a lot of foamy cells in here, like xanthomatous, frothy, bubbly cells. And like you said, there's not no dramatic atypia here, right? The cells right. don't look really specific, but they don't have much atypia. But it's a huge lesion, and like you said, it's ulcerated, so that always kind of worries us. But I will point out that although bad things that grow fast ulcerate, so do things that people pick and scratch at. And people okay. have a tendency to manipulate lesions, particularly if you had a if you had a large mass like this on your leg, you'd be picking at it too, right? We all would. And so that's why sometimes it can be helpful, although this I was looking around for it earlier. This one I don't think has, let me look under the microscope of both pieces. Ah, yes. So this is where the derm path clues can come in handy. Right here, this acanthotic thick epidermis has a real thick granule layer on top, and that's usually a sign of chronic scratching and rubbing, what we call lichen simplex chronicus change in derm path. So when, some, when I see that in here, there's not that because they've scratched all the way through and eroded all the way down into an ulcer. But at the periphery, that tells me they've been rubbing and scratching at this, not just recently, but for a long time, actually. A couple other things. See the collagen trapping there? Yeah. Hard to believe, isn't it? But this is a massive dermatofibroma, a huge oh. one. So dermatofibromas are really important because they're common and they have such a incredible wide range of features. You can have little tiny ones that are really atrophic and sclerotic. You can have massive beast like ones. If I, I actually recall this case, I think it was like eight. It was like, I think eight centimeters. They actually clinically thought it was a sarcoma. They were very concerned about it. It had been present for many years though. Although that doesn't prove something's benign. I've definitely seen malignant things that have been present for years or that have been, I've seen things that have been present for years and then became malignant. You know, I've seen all sorts of exceptions to the rule. So yes, this is one that has been scratched and excoriated dramatically. And, um, but it has that kind of story form pattern of kind of histiocytes or fibroblasts. So that's why we often call these fibrohistiocytic tumors because they're, they're tumors that are composed of a mixture of either fibroblasts and histiocytes or cells that look somewhere in between. I don't think there is, I don't know if there's such a thing as a fibrohistiocyte, but if there is, I don't know what it actually is. But I feel like we lump together all of these particularly cutaneous tumors that have kind of histiocyte and fibroblast overlapping or, or mixtures. And the reason I knew that this is from the lower leg, A, I remembered the case once I saw it, but more importantly, when there's abundant foamy cells in a dermatofibroma, we call that a lipidized dermatofibroma. The other name for it is leg type, or I'm sorry, um, ankle type dermatofibroma because they usually occur at the lower leg or the ankle region. Ankle type, sorry, leg type is for a lymphoma, for a type of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. In derm path, we get like a type for everything. There's like ear type, leg type. We have to love to do that. You know, that's the way our, we are as derm paths, so. But yeah, so when you see real prominent uh, lipidized foamy cells, sometimes it's so much that it can look like a xanthoma or something. And that would be another thing to think of here, except xanthomas are gonna be all foam cells and really not like these sheets of non-foamy stuff. They're gonna really be less cellular than this usually. And you can occasionally have really large xanthomas. We rarely see them in pathology, at least I rarely do, but you can have like tuberous um, and tendinous xanthomas. I think the tendinous ones they don't often remove because they would have to, they would like grow in the Achilles tendon and they wouldn't go take that out. Tuberous ones they sometimes do, but they're going to be a lot less cellular than this. Um, I think sometimes people will get worried about this being a DFSP just because it's so big. But I would say also that a lot of times the clues that we use for diagnosing dermatofibroma and DFSP and things like that are not just the cells, but the, what they do at the periphery. Seeing how it interfaces with the collagen or the fat or the epidermis are all helpful things. And when those clues are taken away from you, like usually when they, someone puts a punch in the middle, a punch biopsy in the middle of a big lesion, but in this case, even though we have a huge section, the lesion was just so big that we couldn't really see what was happening at the periphery. And I think for DF and DFSP particularly, those 
context clues matter to me at first more than what the cells actually look like. Obviously, I do go look at the cells, but what I start with is looking, what's the epidermis doing? What's it doing with the peripheral collagen? What's it doing with the fat down below? And I can't see really any of that here. So one way you can look at that is sometimes you get a little clue if you have a bit of dermis up here, you can see. Sometimes you can see if the epidermis has hyperplasia, which this does, but because there's so much ulcer and scratching like kenification or what we call secondary change, what the person has done to it with their fingernails, that really throws a lot of those clues out the window because you don't really know when something's been scratched a bunch, it's really hard to know what's actually related to the scratching or what's part of the underlying primary uh, tumor. This is a kind of an example though of blunting, or I'm sorry, tabling. See the reedy come down and instead of, this one's kind of rounded or pointed, but this one comes down and then it's like smash. It's like a force field of tumor, like that blocks it and makes it squish flat on the bottom. And I find that pretty helpful. Usually dermatofibromas have those. And let's see if there's any, I didn't see any blood filled spaces or hemocytorin. But the reason that I like this one is because most people never encounter a DF this big and it's just not on your radar after you've seen some during a derm path rotation or in a book, it's not on people's radar to imagine that a DF could be this big. I remember even the surgeons who were pretty experienced soft tissue surgeon who saw this, they were shocked. They were like, no way. And I was like, oh yeah, for sure. So the DFs can occasionally be quite large and the big ones tend to get, um, people get really worried. Oh, and then the one other thing is in these, these ankle type lipidized DFs, they often get these really dense homogenized pink collagen. This one doesn't have it nearly as much as some of them do, but the collagen, they kind of make their own sclerotic collagen. And sometimes it runs through the tumor and wraps around the cells and it makes like these kind of arcs and loops that swirl in between the foamy tumor cells. And I do have a video about um, lipidized ankle type DF on my um, YouTube channel that shows a much more, much more very classic example of uh, ankle type lipidized DF. So, so benign and massive, but, but totally okay. So good to know that that still can be benign even if it's huge like this. But I think this is a really tricky and interesting case for a variety of reasons. All right.